Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the SBK Betting Podcast. And uh, I'm pleased to say we return after a very, very good week indeed for the pod. Uh, Ross Miller had a, a bit of a tough task at hand, considering this time last year he, he rolled in with, in with his first podcast and had a very good week. And uh, we wanted the same again. And Ross, did you deliver? No, not quite, Jess. But it was, was, oh, it was, come ha- on. It was, happy, it was happy enough with, uh, with uh, Highway 102. Um, I thought that was a good performance. I think he's a progressive horse and Chris Gordon Yard in absolutely flying form. Yeah, a nine to one winner of the London Handicap Hurdle Ascot. You can't really complain about that. In total, we got four winners. Um, really good prices as well. Our power won the London Gold Cup at seven to one for uh, myself and Dan Overall, who joined the podcast. And Dan also put up Brave Man's game uh, for the Charlie Hall at two to one. He was just perfect at his fences and his strong, strong nap selection. Prashima was a, a, a fabulous uh, winner of the Yorkshire Hurdle at nine to two. So lots of good price successes. Um, so we're going to find a bit more of the same this week Uh, we've got the Badgers Beer Handicap Chase that's going to be our focus point but Tom Collins is uh, sitting like a kid uh, on Christmas Eve ahead of um, the Breeders' Cup and we're going to get into a a preview of that as well um, as uh, that is uh, uh, definitely Tom Collins' bread and butter but before we get to that we will start with the Badgers Beer Handicap Chase at Wincanton on Saturday 150 is the race um, and it's been really spiced up with the the late uh, decision to have Frodon run in this race as opposed to go to Darren Royal. Um, and Rillo uh, is uh, the other runner for Paul Nichols, and he heads the betting at 9 to 2. Frodon at 5 to 1. Lord Accord 11 to 2. Captain Ord 6 to 1. Potterman 8 to 1. Red Happy 10 to 1. Rocco 12s with Slipway. Irish Prophecy 14 to 1. Uh, and it's bigger prices for the rest of them. Um, Ross, as I said, Frodon is a really intriguing contender in here. At the ten-year-old rising eleven C- is could he be still as good as ever? What do you feel like about the depth of this field, and uh, where's your selection coming from? I think it's a I think it's a brilliant race. I think we're lucky the rain has come. They've had a fair bit of rain, and it's still not going to ride much uh, slower than than good. Um, so thank God the rain came. Frodon adds a fascinating dimension to it. Uh, is he as good as he was? Most certainly not. Um, but he is a horse that won a handicap off 164. So when he was at his best, he was a very, very good horse. Um, he's been dropped six pound for his run in the Ultima, which looks fairly generous considering he was he was struck into during that race. So I think you could probably say he was was hampered by his well being in that run. Um, I just sort of slighted at the view last year that he was starting to get a little moody in his races and perhaps not as full of zest and enthusiastic as he was. And I think that's a key attribute to him is that sort of forward going, free jumping style. Um, first time out might be the time to catch him. And Paul Nichols is in great form. I think it's 13 winners from his, his last 34 or something like that, 38% thereabouts. Um, so you've got to respect him. I just wonder whether Father Time is catching up with him in a handicap when they might just take him off his feet. So wouldn't be a surprising winner, but I've looked elsewhere. I think you have to mention mm-hmm. Rocco um, coming in six pound lower than when winning it last year. Um, but he was a surprising winner last year. He's done nothing in five runs since down to 128. Jordan Naylor keeps the partnership, but he's without his three pound claim. Now Rocco surprised me last year when he won it. Uh, he'll surprise me if he wins it again. If he does, It won't be a surprise because he's handicapped to go close off a break, but you just can't be backing him off his current profile. Potterman, again, uh, just a pound higher than when second last year, but he was pulled up on his last start. The one I'm really quite sweet on is Captain Orr. Uh, He was fourth in this last year off 135. Um, My understanding is that they struggled to get him absolutely right last year. He had niggly little problems. I think sometimes his bloods weren't quite right. Sometimes his scopes weren't quite right. Um, The time they thought they had him, cherry ripe was when he won the coral trophy off a mark of 127 Uh, he's run two solid enough races since i think his reappearance run last time was perfectly adequate under elias collier um at chepstow all of christians i think come forward for a run he's off a mark of 130 Mm. now so just three pound higher than that kempton win Um, he was very well fancy for this last year in similar conditions when finishing fourth i think he's the one to be on i think he'll go very close and i think this is the first target Christian Williams has had for one of his horses this year. Um, and as we discussed many times last year, he is 
absolutely mustard at finding these races, targeting them and scooping the pot. He certainly is. He definitely is. I just want to ask you on that quickly, just looking at Kristen Williams' form uh, over the last couple of weeks, he's had uh, no winners from the last 17 runners. So it's been a while since his last winner. Now you look at the prices, some of them are, are be three-figure prices. Um, and so they're clearly not that fancy. As you say, they need their first run. But have you, have you, you, are you a little bit underwhelmed by the way that they've started? Do you feel like this is just, a, or, or, uh, or, 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 can, or can some of them be forgiven? No, I, I, I'm not. Uh, maybe this is blind, blind faith in my fellow Welshman, but no, I'm not. I'm not worried in the slightest. I think all of these horses are geared up for targets later down the line. I think there's a number that have probably gone high enough in the handicap and probably need to come down again before they're competitive. And he's got a lot of young novice hurdlers that probably, to all intents and purposes, are going to be handicap chasers in time. They're not going to be up to winning a novice hurdle, so they're probably not primed to run to their absolute maximum these novice hurdles should we put it that way mm. um so no i think captain Ord had a prep run ground conditions are right i think christian williams uh, knows the time of day and i think you're fine now as the rain starts to come these horses on their second and third run perhaps coming down close to their last winning marks you'll start to see an upturn in their results Okay, interesting um, thoughts from Ross. Six to one for Captain Ord um, off the back of that pipe opener, which a lot of these horses uh, do have. Um, you've got some of them, you know, the likes of, of Potterman and um, and Rillo, who's, who's who's been installed as a favourite. He's coming here off a break. Um, he's got a lot of letters in their names as opposed to uh, good figures. And then I feel, Tom, there's a another side of this race where you've got the the up and coming that are rising up up in the handicap, the likes of Slipway and, and Red Happy. Um, it's a, a, a tale of two halves, really, in this race. But how did you un unravel it? Yeah, I think Ross has perfectly previewed this race because he's kind of the way I looked at it as well. Um, he mentioned a couple of the stats of Paul Nichols, which were where I was going to go as well. He's won this race three times in the last five years, but he's got a 38% strike rate in the last two weeks. Um, of, of course, we're recording this on Thursday morning. He's got plenty of runners on Thursday as well, so that could even improve. Um, but with Frodon, although he goes really well fresh, I agree that he was maybe regressing last year. And then Rillo, that horse just owes me a penny or two from the past. I think I've been with him four or five times and he's never won for me. He tends to be a horse that promises a lot and just doesn't deliver. So I'm definitely against him at the prices. Captain Orr was the last off my shortlist. I think he's going to run a good race. Um, but I ended up going for Potterman just on the price basis. He's going to be around 10, 12 to 1. And I think that's perfectly fair. As you've touched on, his recent form figures aren't great. Lots of peas in there. Um, he wasn't producing his best in the back end of last year. But this is his Gold Cup. This is the race that Alan King would have got him ready for. If you look at the last two seasons in the Badger Beers, he's finished second both times. He's then regressed later in the year. So I think we're going to see a similar story. It's going to be much like Groundhog Day. Hopefully this time he doesn't bump into Rocco and Rocco beats him comfortably. Um, but I thought he ran well enough last year to say that if he comes back in the same kind of form, he's got a fantastic chance of winning. And when there are doubts about the market leaders, both of whom trained by Paul Nichols, um, mm. I think you can take a chance on a horse at a double figure price and Potterman is that one for me. Okay, Potterman, uh, definitely going to be fresh. He's, he's eight to one though. Um, is, is that is that you wouldn't want to see him getting any shorter than that? I would imagine TC. No, no shorter than eight. So I think he'll probably drift out of tens. To be honest, on the day, um, there'll be some money for Captain Ord, I'm sure, um, as well as both Frodon because he's a fan favourite, and Emrillo as well because he showed last year in handicap chases that he can run what, to a good level. So I think he might be a slight drifter on the day. People seeing all mm -hmm. those P's in the old form figures, but uh, yeah, yeah, that wouldn't put me off. Okay, right. Well, um, plenty of peas in uh, Potterman's uh, form figures, as you say, but could be his day um, where it all comes good for, for the Alan King runner. I'm um, going to side with Lord Accord, who comes here off the back of his, his great victory at Cheltenham last time. Uh, Richie McLennan uh, keeps the ride. He, he's gone up five pounds in the handicap, um, but he's still very well weighted for a race like this. Ten stone six on his back. He's a young horse, seven year old. I think the ground is key. Now, we are getting a lot of rain at the moment down the south where we are, but it's all very localised. When Canton have struggled to even get their this, their meetings on, um, they've been cancelled and cancelled because of quick ground. I think it is still genuinely 
good and um lord accord is a horse that just does need it um pretty um pretty lively so if it remains like that i think he could be he could be well suited by it and he comes into off the, and just in in really good form for the nilmar holland yard so that's lord accord for me um at 11 to 11 to 2 for the badges beers handicap which as we say is got the the wonderful frodon in it and Embrillo, um who heads the betting for paul nichols who's just been in in absolute great order as well um we've got so so much racing on this weekend uh, it's the sort of the end of the flat season officially with the november handicap at doncaster i'd imagine there's been a lot of rain up there as well um but we've um I've got uh, plenty of opportunities now to look at the be- best of the week from our team. So, um, TC, I'll come back to you first. Yeah, we're going to actually go to Doncaster for that end of the end of the flat season meeting. Now, you know, when there's flat racing on, I tend to look there first. Um, and it's the listed Gillies Philly Stakes. Very interesting name for a race, that one. Um, at Doncaster, it's the 130. Now, it's a real wide open handicap. <clears throat> a listed sorry, race, sorry. But there are plenty of three-year-olds in there, four-year-olds as well. Um, Three odds have won five of the last nine renewals of this race, including three of the last four. And the market is going to be dominated by three odds, including a, a Godolphin runner who's going to be top of the market. But I much prefer Moon de Vega. <clears throat> now, if you look at her form figures from this year, you'd think, why would you back this horse? Because she hasn't shown that much just on the numbers that you can see on the, on the race card or the paper. However, she's been super highly tried. I mean, she ran in the Epsom Oaks. I have to say Epsom Oaks because she ran in the Cheshire Oaks before. Um, so she's been kind of put in at the deep end so far this season. Last time out, she ran on the all-weather, which just wouldn't have helped. Last year, she made a winning start on a third outing at Doncaster on soft ground in the autumn. I think this has kind of been the aim. They've just been waiting for soft ground. It's just not happened this season. There's been you know brilliant weather throughout the summer for, for Great Britain. Um, now we're going to get heavy conditions. I think Rafe Beckett will be praising uh, the weather because you know he needs, he needs plenty of rain for her. And if you look at her pedigree, she's a daughter of Lope de Vega, who obviously won the uh, Group 1 Prix de Jockey Club on soft ground. She's out of a mare as well called Lunesque, whose only career victory came on good to soft over one mile three furlong. So she's got plenty of stamina and plenty of pedigree for testing conditions. Last year when she won at Doncaster, she had to make the running that day. There was no speed up front. She briefly got passed by a horse called Suffragette, who was trained by Mark Johnson. Now, it looked like she was going to go backwards through the pack, but she actually fought back really gallantly over a mile to get her head back in front. After the race, the jockey said that she was idling and she didn't want to be in the lead at all and you can mark up her effort, which I think is perfectly plausible. And if you look at how highly she's been tried this year, I mean, there is no runner in this race that would have even been considered for the Oaks. Like, Rafe Beckett is clearly regarding her quite highly within the stable. I think she's got a fantastic chance. She's around six to one. I think she'll probably go off a little bit shorter, maybe fours, and she'll be my nap of the week. Moon de Vega in the 130 at Doncaster. God, very, very confident um, uh, t- Tom Collins is behind Moon de Vega. Also, as daughter of Lope de Vega, how well does Rafe Beckett do with um, daughters of Lope de Vega? He loves them. He'll buy them blind. Um, and let, yeah, we'll see if Moon de Vega can uh, continue on his success with them. Um, a really interesting selection from a, a bit of flat uh, racing that we've also got on Saturday. Uh, Ross, uh, what what do you like? So I've looked at the 335 at Wing Canton, Jess. Uh, Ben Pauling made the move to his uh, new yard at Norton Downs Golf Club uh, to coincide with the start of this season. And he's operating at a 23% strike rate, which when you compare it to his strike rate over the previous five seasons of 13%, suggests very strongly that this move has has been for the benefit of the horses. Um, Mm. The Barley Basket made a return after a wind up at Stratford uh, back in the late summer, um, ran a good race to finish third, Built on that when a facile winner uh, over two and a half miles at your tox to the next time had a fair hike in the weights of about nine pound, but that didn't look to be stopping him last time at market raise. And when he sort of made an unexpected error four out and, and then got bumped by the horse in second and shipped Keelan Woods out the side door, um, it's too far out to say he was going to win, but he was certainly traveling nicely and, and jumping beautifully up to that point. Um, he now comes here with Luca Morgan taking three pound off. I think the conditionals are a, a fairly moderate bunch, if I'm honest, at the moment. Luca Morgan, for me, is one of the one of the standouts. Great value for his uh, £3. Um, and I, I think the Bali basket will go very close in this. 
Yeah, I, I've been really um, impressed with uh, Ben Pauling's horses um, since they've uh, they've been starting off this season. Um, a really intriguing type that Dibali basket. I'd say Luca Morgan on board um, in the three thirty five at Wing Canton. Um, I'm gonna head to uh, Doncaster myself um, for the November handicap, and uh, this race is always a, a bit of a war of attrition, especially if it gets soft. But it's actually heavy up there, um, so it's going to be a real, real t- test of stamina and I think it should suit um, Seman for George Baker and Neil Callan's on board which is uh, we know that he's been a man for the big occasion this season um, this horse has been uh, going up in the in the handicap throughout the season went up five pounds for winning last time at Newmarket it's been weighted with since they got a deluge of rain um, the night before and uh, that really helped his chances at Newmarket where he just showed um, the staying qualities that he needs and I think he's been well placed by the George Baker team um, and although he's in stall six which I think I've looked through past results and you want to be uh, at least a double figure uh, draw potentially in the November handicap I think that he does have a nice profile for it and I think he could be even a not a bad price as well it could be about 10 to 12 to 1 um, I uh, will we'll go from our best bets to our place bets because that could nearly be considered one um, and uh, TC I'll come back to you for a place play yeah i actually don't have one this week jess i thought the racing was super difficult obviously it's the end of the flat season start the jump season where there are plenty of unknowns and also it's the breeders cup as we've already touched on all my focus has Mm -hmm. basically been looking at keeneland so i'm going to avoid place play i'll just open the floor for ross okay take it away ross and then we'll come back to tc because he is chomping at the bit for a breeders (laughs) cup chat (laughs) so the place play i've gone i've gone actually to the grand session over the big fences at aintree and, and this horse has an ideal makeup for a place play because, I mean, I can't tell you when he last won. It's a long time ago, but he gets zero respite from the handicapper because he is so consistent. And it's the Dan Scouten train spirit of the games. Um, he finished third in two good handicaps at Cheltenham uh, last season off 137 and then 136 uh, when third in the plate behind a friend of the podcast called Cody. Um, he just turns up every time. He then went on to the top of uh, off this mark, jumped very badly over the first, then got a bit of a fright uh, about the seventh or eighth fence um, and was on the back foot from there on. But he finished really well uh, to run on into third, albeit beaten a fair distance on ground that would be plenty quick enough for him. All his best form comes on soft ground. Uh, he made a pleasing reappearance over three miles, possibly too pleasing, actually, because he's gone up two pound from 134 to 136. But that's around about his mark. It's, it, he's not handicapped out of it. He'll probably find one or two better handicapped horses in this race. But I think with that experience behind him and likely softer ground, uh, I think he'll go close in the, in the Grand Sefton, just not too close. OK, Spirit of the Games and a, a real old um, hero of, of National Hunt Racing for his connections. OK, thanks to Ross. Um, right, TC, uh, we've given you um, a plenty of time now to, to wait for this. Uh, the Breeders' Cup, obviously, uh, for you, the two of the best days of racing that, that we that we can have. And this is a, a fabulous edition of it. Back at Keeneland for just the third time. Uh, we've got some sensational horses appearing, some really quality European challenges as well. Uh, from your perspective, an over an overview if you will of of what we've got to look forward to yeah fantastic couple of days at keeneland the fact is at keeneland and not santa anita or del mar gives a uk punter and or just a horse racing fan plenty of time to watch the racing as well we've got early starts we don't have to wait till half past midnight for the classic on saturday for example we're talking half nine instead the race in the breeders cup races on saturday start at 350 so it's perfect to watch make sure you tune in to watch 14 breeders cup races over two days at keeneland super excited for it we've got a great mix of the best us horses We've got a load of Europeans going over, one Japanese runner as well. It's going to be a fantastic couple of days. Obviously, the headlines are going to be about flight line in the Classic. The horse that everyone is now talking about after Baid has lost. Um, but I was talking about it beforehand, and I know plenty of others <laughs> were. This $1 million uh, Tappet cult is phenomenal. If you want to see a proper racehorse, make sure you tune in for the Classic on Saturday. He's 5-5, five five, looking to continue his unbeaten streak for trainer John Sadler. It's going to be probably his hardest task to date as well. He's, he's around one to two right now. He'll probably go off a little shorter, especially in the US. But life is good as in the field as well. The horse that was favourite for the Dubai World Cup last year, he led them turning in and got passed that day by Country Grammar and a couple of others. Life is good as a real speedball. So is Flightline. So if they go hammer and tongs, maybe Flightline gets beat. But I can't see it happening. I think Flightline will win. 
loads of other good horses running as well over the two days. Nest faces Malafart and Clarier in the distaff on Saturday. Three fantastic mares, really good horses. Um, Modern Games goes in the mile for Charlie Appleby. He's also represented in the turf with, by Rebels Romance and Nation's Pride. Loads of runners as well for the Europeans in the juvenile races on Friday, including the Platinum Queen, who's going to be a short price favourite, but is also drawn in gate 12. So is a horse that I'm looking to take on. Um, yeah, I'm just super excited, Jess, if you can't tell. Lots of picks, especially if you go onto betting.getsbk.com where you can see my mm-hmm. columns over the two days. But uh, yeah, hopefully a few winners. Yeah, it's a, it's a meeting that I love as well and, and have been following the, the p- potential European contingent throughout the throughout the year too. And I think we've got a really healthy load. And I think it was 2020 where we had such a spectacular evening on the second day um, with Tanawa and Adaria um, and Order of Australia, who's back to, to, to try and get um, his revenge in the Breeders' Cup mile. So it, it could be really, we could have a really strong run of things. Is there, if you could select one, one nap and one value play for us to take away with, what would they be? Is there a European horse that you think has got the, the best opportunity here? Well, my Friday column's live. My Saturday picks I made last night, so these are very fresh. Um, European player, the main European player, I think the horse with the best chance is probably Nashua on Saturday in the Philly and Mare turf. Uh, I think she's got phenomenal chances at 550. Obviously, John and Thady Gosden um, haven't sent too many runners over there. She's their number one. I think it's a pretty weak race, especially for US runners. So she's got a great chance. But she's not in my Napa next best. They're both US horses. Flightline would be the obvious selection here, but obviously I'm going to avoid him. Um, the Nap, if you want a horse that I don't think can be beaten, that is Jackie's Warrior in the sprint on Saturday at 6.30. He's currently around four to five. I make him around a one to two shot. I think he's got a phenomenal chance with a clean break. He should win. Next best, I'll go for one at a bit of a price because, you know, we don't want two odds on shots here. Um, so oblico- obligatory, I can't even say the name, obligatory, obligatory. Yeah, uh, around 10 to one in the fully MS sprint, the 350 on Saturday. Um, she's a deep closer. She's going to need loads of pace up front and you need the pace basically to collapse and then she can finish off her race down the outside which is a slight negative because Keelan has been suiting front runners throughout the full meet, which has just ended, um, and the track will be playing quick. But there are loads of front runners, loads of pacey horses in this race, and I do think it's going to suit the closer. She's 10 to 1. I think she's going to win for Bill Mott in the 350. Okay, you've got a real uh, strong um, affinity to these American horses, and yeah, I do. I think I think we shouldn't uh, underestimate them as well. We always feel like, especially our turf horses, uh, normally better than them. But um, yeah, I think that there's one horse for me in particular. I wonder if you agree, TC, that is going to be uh, much better, much faster than than ours in the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint, and I think that's Golden Pal again. Look, he's so so good when he's on home soil. He just breaks from his gates so quickly, and obviously we've got the Wonder Mare that's in Highfield Princess in the in the uh, in the in that race as well, but I think he's just he just dominates, doesn't he? Um, so although my heart says Highfield Princess, my head says Golden Pow and that Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint, and uh, and also slightly underestimated maybe, but Rebels Romance in the Breeders' Cup Turf. Uh, he's the, he's got James Doyle on board. We're obviously, Nations Pride for um, Godolphin is is heading the heading the betting and potentially will go a favourite with William Buick on board. But I just think it, Rebels Romance has been expertly placed as has nation's pride um to try and keep them apart so be fascinated to see what they'll do um when they uh, there are a lot of corns in that in the in the in that show piece too um as tc has said you can see you can read much more about um his insight into the breeders cup on uh the spk blog um we have got so much to look forward to on friday and saturday from a breeders cup perspective but then of course of always back to our domestic action here for the jumps fans at wincanton and throughout the rest of the country and and uh, we also um, have some the end of the turf racing in the UK at Doncaster too. So that is a look, quick look through all the best that we can give you. A reminder that new SBK customers can get £30 in free bets by betting £10. T's and C's always apply. Make sure to subscribe so you can listen to this podcast every week without forgetting. But you can listen on YouTube and all your podcast feeds and uh, make sure to check out the SBK Ambassador content that we've got available to you as well, including stable tours. That's it for another week. We hope we found a few more winners. TC, enjoy the Breeders' Cup. I know that you will be in your element and Ross as well to you. Best of luck for your selections. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week. <laughs>